it's Cole and Jake here with the Total Potential Podcast, and we are thrilled to be joined today by Larry Hagner. Thanks so much for being here with us today, Larry. Oh, my pleasure. This is fun. Let's do this. Yeah. So Larry is a best-selling author, and he is the founder of the Dad Edge Alliance and podcast. And I have to tell you that anytime I get to talk to somebody who really cares a lot about being a dad, it like makes my heart sing. So I'm just really thankful to have you here today. Um, Before we kind of dive into the work that you do, I'm really interested to know how you ever came into this space. Like what was your background before you decided to take on this world? So I, I got my undergrad in health and exercise science when I got a minor in nutrition. It's basically a glorified degree to be a personal trainer. <laughs> but all kidding, all kidding aside, I was going to go into like corporate wellness and run wellness programs and that kind of thing. And I just, I had a true passion for health because I grew up as a really overweight kid. And, uh, you know, my mom, when I was about 15 years old, was dating a guy who was a total nightmare. Like this guy was terrible out of all the guys that out of all the father figures that were in and out of my life this guy was by far the worst one thing he did do though is he um showed me you know he he helped me into the fitness world you know i was i I had never lifted a weight my entire life i had two left feet when it came to athletics and um i was one of those kids who was always picked last you know during recess and all that and uh he really showed me fitness you know he uh it actually (laughs) kind of a funny story. I was 15 years old and I went to this dance sort of mixer at the high school that I went to. And I was really overweight and I was checking out this girl that I, that I liked. And I was waiting all night long for that, for those last three slow songs, you know? So I finally got the courage to go up and talk to her. So the, 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 the last song was playing. I finally got the courage to go up and talk to her. And I was like, Hey, would you like to dance? And she literally did this. She looked me up and down looked me up and down and she said, not a chance. And I was like, oh. so I went home that night and, you know, he, my mom's boyfriend, he was living with us at the time. And he's like, Hey man, I just got, I told him what happened. He's like, I just got one question for you. Are you, are you tired of being a fat ass yet? And I'm like, wow, that's kind of harsh, but yeah, I am. You know? So he's like, all right, you want to do something about it? And he was like an ex fitness bodybuilder type guy. So he really knew his way around that kind of stuff. He woke me up every day at 4.30 a.m. I, I worked out every day before high school, before school. I hated it at first. And then I literally just kind of became addicted to it. And so, so much so that I loved it so much that I was like, man, I just want to help people. You know, I want to help people with their fitness, with their health and confidence, all that stuff. So I got my degree in it. I started in pharmaceutical sales right out of college because I put myself through college. So I graduated with quite a bit of debt. And I realized that that particular industry didn't make any money. And that scared me because between my wife and I, we owed $60,000 in student loans. And I think the, the, the entry level salary for what I was going to be doing was like $24,000. So it scared me. So I started pharmaceutical sales, medical device sales. And yeah. And then it was in 2012, I started good dad project. And unfortunately Fortunately, unfortunately, it really came at a dark time. It was a really dark night. uh, And, you know, it's something I wasn't proud of. But out of that was birthed uh, what we're doing today. Yeah. Okay. So my mind is just spinning because we have a few things in common to start with. Number one, I also have a degree in nutrition and and then the other side of exercise science um, and went into the field of dietetics really wanting to help people, but also had the same experience where you make no money doing that job. Um, but it sounds like you, and this is an experience both Jake and I have really profoundly had, which is that accessing the movement and like that physical layer allowed to access more of who we were. Is that, is that what your experience was when you were at first hating the 4.30 wake up calls, but then kind of got into the rhythm of that. Yeah, I think it was, it was, rhythm is a great word for it. I I love how you use that. It was definitely the rhythm. It was the confidence. It was uh, the fact that I was suddenly not 
I, I suddenly had a stronger body, which gave me a stronger mind, which gave me more confidence, which made me feel like I could do things that I otherwise wouldn't. I mean, not taking care of myself physically for so long spilled over into all kinds of areas of my life. You know, I was probably emotionally unhealthy. I was physically unhealthy. I didn't have confidence. It spilled over into my productivity into schoolwork, uh, my relationship with friends, you know, dating girls, like the whole nine yards. So really, you know, one I, I I've been working out since I was 17 and I don't think I've ever stopped. And I think for the past, gosh, maybe three years, like, I don't know if I've ever taken a day off. Like I do something every day. And that's what I've noticed is the days that, you know, I do that. It's I create more space, more opportunities, more related, like just, I'm just overall more productive. I'm in a really good headspace. And, you know, I'm just, I can, I feel like I can go out and do just about anything, but it all starts with, you know, I wake up every morning right now at 4.05. I don't know why I picked that time. Nice. That's when my alarm Good. goes off is 4.05. And I'm in the gym by 4.35, you know, and um, I'm home by 6.55 so I can take my kids to school. So things like that, you know, it's like every, you know, in the morning, it's, it's very regimented. Yeah. That's funny. You're 4.05. My wake up time is 5.04. No way. So, That's funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it's very similar for what you said, you know, just that, that routine of doing the same thing every morning. It's, it's important, but that's funny. Larry, I'm curious. So you, you said that this project was born out of a dark space. Tell us more of what that, what that means. Yeah. I joke, you know, I joke about it. Cause you know, the, a lot of questions I get on podcasts is like, so when did you, how did you know you want to start doing this? I was like, well, I woke up one day and I realized I knew everything about fatherhood and marriage. I just had to share it with the world. And then that's like <laughs> total BS. Uh, you know, I was the complete extreme opposite of what I am now. And I think a lot of it had to do with my childhood. And I mean, you said that you heard me on unbeatable mind podcast with Mark divine. And I shared this story with him and, and he even challenged me on it. Cause I kind of flew through it. Cause I knew he wanted to get to more, probably more content stuff. And he was just like, I think he even said something as I shared the story. He was like, <laughs> he's like, wait a second, let's slow down. He's like, so wait, what happened? So I'll, I'll share this with you. Um, I was born in 1975 uh, my parents, my biological father, and my mother were married for like, I think four years. And then they got divorced nine months or so after I was born. And I think my dad kind of hung out and he did the visitation thing. I don't remember it. And I have no recollection of him whatsoever, you know, and I remember being four years old and I remember being in preschool and I remember knowing what a dad was because my friends had dads who would pick them up. Like I, I'd always see guys in suits, you know, come pick up their kids so I was like, oh, wow, that must be a dad. Well, my version of dads back then was moms go out and they find dads. Like it, I didn't understand the logic or the biology, I guess you could say as, as well. And my mom just hadn't found ours yet. And it was, I didn't feel like I was missing out on a thing. Like my mom and I got along great. It was cool. And then I'll never forget the very first time she brought a man home. And I think she had been dating him for a while. They worked together. And this guy comes walking in. I'll never forget it. And he had this brown trench coat on this three piece, three piece suit, this double Windsor knot. He was carrying a briefcase. He had the feathered 1979 feathered hair mustache. And the first question I asked this guy after my mom introduces me to him is, are you going to be my dad? Cause I thought that was it. I was like, sweet. She found him. Awesome. He's going to live with us now. Like literally thought it was that simple. And I think my mom really kind of took that as a sign from the universe of like, Oh my gosh, I probably should marry this guy. I don't know if she ever really loved him. I think she liked him a lot. But they got married and they were married from the time I was five to the time I was 10. And every year they were married, it just got progressively worse. I mean, I'm talking like he was a good guy, taught me a lot of manners. He was ex-military. He had a white collar job. He made a lot of money, I think, because my mom was able to quit her job. But he also had this rage of a temper as well when he drank. And he became physically, mentally, emotionally abusive when he drank. My mom did too. I mean, there were cops called to my house. Like I'll never forget my mom actually hit him one time with this wood, 1970 something wooden purse. And there was blood all over the walls and all this other stuff. I mean, it was crazy, crazy stuff. So anyway, he left when I was 10. And there's a part of me that I was like, man, that really sucks. I lost my dad because he was the only one I knew as dad. He adopted me. And, but if there was also a part of me as relieved, I was like, well, you know, okay, well, no, no more fighting. So that's kind of cool. And I started asking questions and I'm like, wait a second. Like, why was I in the wedding? Like, why, why did he come around? Cause I knew about the birds and the bees at this point. I was like, Who, where did I come from? And my mom was like, well, I was actually married before your dad and 
showed me the photos and the wedding album two years later when I was 12. I won't get into the details for the sake of time, but I met him and it was by accident. And we had this, and I, I just dove in from both feet. I was like, oh my God, it's my real dad. Like, and I really wanted a dad. 12 years old is sort of like a super vulnerable, tender age, especially for a young man wanting a father. And we hung out for like six months. He was remarried. He had a two-year-old son. He had another one on the way. And I don't exactly even remember because the conversation as I share it now is, was fuzzy. But basically it was like, we need to go our separate ways. This is not a good time. And I was like, man, that sucks. So he was gone. So by the time I was 12, he was gone. Stepdad entered in. He was gone. 12 years old, re-entered my biological father. He was gone. My mom started dating like all these different men. All of them were toxic. All of them had, were big drinkers. All of them were partiers. All have had s- some sort of element of abuse or they were just maniacs, to be honest. And I will say this though, um, all of them taught me something, you know, whether it be like, this is what you don't do, or this is what you do. Um, and my mom's been married a total of three times, but I'll, I'll share this final story here. But when I was 30, two things happened. I became a father for the first time and I was sitting in a coffee shop at a business meeting who came walking in for his morning coffee, but my biological father, the one who I hadn't seen since I was 12. And I won't get into the details of how we reconnected, but I will say we reconnected. He's still married to the same woman. Here we are 15 years, almost 16 years later. Uh, we have a relationship. We've had a relationship. I have two younger half brothers. We get along great. Um, and we've got a friendship. The one thing I'll say about being a father is that I learned all these things of what not to do. But one thing I think we can all agree on is what you resist will persist. It's kind of like, don't think of the word ele- elephant. And what do you think of it? You think of an elephant. So what happened to answer your question, 2011, 2010, 2011, um, my son was four at the time. He is my second born. I have four boys. He's 13 now. He was four at the time. And he stepped out of line. I, I spanked him and he hit the ground. And I was just in disbelief. Like, you know, I was impatient that day. It was probably a bad day. And he was acting a fool. And I spanked him. He hit the ground. I was like, oh, my God. Like, I can't believe I did that. Well, I went to go pick him up. And he looked at me like I was a monster. And I was like, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to portray the fact that I was beating my kids. I wasn't. Um, but I hit him hard and he hit the ground and he looked at me like, oh my God, are you going to hurt me again? And I was just like, oh my God. I, so in that moment, I didn't see him. I saw me. Like I remember being in that position, when, you know? So it was in that moment, I went into my office and I do what every adult does when you have a bad moment. I went on Facebook to distract myself in my office. I was like, I don't want to think about this. And, and I was emotional and I'll never forget it. I saw this button in the left-hand corner that said, create a page. And I clicked it and I don't know what it was, but the good dad project just rolled off my mind, off my heart and onto that keyboard. And it was in that moment that I was really good at my job. You know, I had a great career. I was always promoted. I was always doing the things I needed to do. And did well financially. And then um, I was always good with my fitness, you know, stuff like that. And I thought to myself, I have no clue what I'm doing. As it pertains to being a man, a husband, a father, I don't know how to communicate with my wife. I don't know how to create psychological safety and intimacy. I don't, I don't know how to connect with her. I don't know how to be patient with my kids. Like, I don't even know what it means to be a good role model. I have no clue what the heck I'm doing. And I'm tired of not knowing. So what if I took the same mentality of like, well, I go to sales training, be a better salesperson. You know, I go to management training and leadership training, be a better leader. You know, I go to seminars to take better care of my health. Why wouldn't I do that in these areas? So it was in that moment that Good Dad Project, I was like, I'm going to learn something new every day. And I'm just going to post it here. And I'm not going to do it for people following me. I'm just going to post it here. And whoever, maybe it'll inspire somebody. I don't know. But it was more public accountability. And that's how Good Dad Project got started, which is now Dad Edge. Wow. That's remarkable. It's a super interesting trajectory. Um, No, it's amazing. Yeah. And I think we all have had that experience, right? As a parent where you do have like this reflective moment where you're like, wow, that was almost like not from myself right? Like that, 
there's a disconnect between who I am and how I feel and how I want to be and the actions or what just came out of my mouth or whatever it might be. And that's profound that you were able to take that and like instantaneously, like flip it on its edge. Yeah, that's really remarkable. As the faith book grew, what, how did, I mean, what was the next phase? Like how, so you go from learning something once a day and posting it and trying to put that into your own life. Like how, what, how does the snowball go from there? I'll actually never forget the very next thing that happened. I think I had that Facebook page for, I don't know, six months, something like that. And I was, I was, you know, pretty religious about it, you know, as far as like, oh, like I just learned this new hack on patience. All right. I just learned this whole new hack on communicating with your wife, like, you know, things like that. And I got contacted. I got a private message from this woman and she's like, Hey, I've been following your page for quite some time. And there's, um, we, we will, I'm a part of a mom's group at this church. And, um, do you have a phone number that I can contact you because we want to hire you as a speaker? And I'm like a speaker. <laughs> I was like, for what, you know, I was like, what do you want me to speak on? She's like, just give me your number. I'll call you. So I, she called me and she's like, Hey, you know, like, we really want you to come and speak. I was like, on what? And she's like, you know, on fatherhood and you know, marriage. And I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I don't even know what I'm talking. What would you want me to talk about? <laughs> and she's like, I just want you to talk about yourself and like, and your experiences and just basically a day in the life of an imperfect man and father. I was like, Oh, I can do that. I knew that really well. And so I was like, how many, how many women are we talking about? Cause my, my wife was a member of our women's group at our church. It was like 20 people. She's like, there's about 330 of us. And I'm like, are 330. I was like, are you serious? And she's like, yeah. She's like, can you do it next week? And I'm like, oh my God. I was like, uh, sure. Why not? So I went out there and I'll never forget like the day before that I was going to do this thing. I finally wrote something up. Like, I was like, how, what am I even going to talk about? And I, I, I came up with five elements of being a man, husband, father. And it was basically the five mistakes that we make as men. And it was a lot of serious self-deprecating humor. Uh, but one thing I noticed was, is when I spoke, like, and how I spoke very authentically and vulnerably, I did it with humor, man, these women loved it and they laughed and they thought it was great. And then, and then, uh, I got hired to speak again and then again, and then again, I was like, I don't even know what, what's going on here. So what I realized, I didn't know it at the time, but what I realize now is that, you know, everybody wants to paint this picture that we have it all together as parents. Like everything is fine, good, good, and fine. You know, we're great. And the thing that's missing is that true authenticity. Like I, I joke with like when people, you know, ask me now, like, Hey man, how are things going? I was like, you want me to be honest or do you want me to lie? I can tell you it's good, but you know, a lot of it's a shit show from time to time. Right. And it's that vulnerability and authenticity that makes us relatable. So 2013, I was like, man, what if there's something here? I don't know. Like maybe I'll start a blog. So I started a blog and I'll never forget being on one side of the table with my wife and I, and on the other side of the table was a coach to help, to help people start basically brands and websites and blogs and all that, and his wife. And he slid a proposal over for $12,000 to help me for six months to build this website. I was like, You're, nope, I'm good. Thank you. I'll just do my Facebook page. And my wife, I'll never forget it. She put her hand on my hand. She's like, if you don't do this, you're going to regret it. I'm here to support you. Let's just do this. And I'm like, are you kidding me? We've spent, we spent less on cars. She's like, just do it. So I was like, wow, okay, I'll, I'll do it. And I did it. Did that for a couple of years. The blog really didn't do much. And then I started podcasting in 2015. And that was really out of my comfort zone. One of the biggest first guests I ever had was Mark Devine. And wow. I'll never forget having Mark on. I think he was like, Big first like, guest. Right. Well, he was like episode 28. So I had been podcasting for like six months. And I was like, man, like, what if there is something here? And, you know, here we are six years later, um, over 700 episodes recorded, um, getting ready actually to launch. It's not out there yet, but my third book, I just booked Matthew McConaughey to come on next Monday. And I'm like, I can't even believe that this is happening. And it's all because I'm an idiot dad and husband. And all I'm doing is talking about how much of an idiot I am 
and just learning from these guests who come on to teach me how to be better and the audience gets to do it with me. But that's really been the whole mission is, hey, let's embrace imperfection. Let's embrace the messiness. And let's just see if we can take one or two or maybe three nuggets from these people who are operating at a pretty darn high level. And what if we just implemented those things? And what, what could happen? What could be, you know, what, what, could, what could be real, right? What's possible past that? Yeah, what's Absolutely. possible? You know, the thing, the saying at our house, and it's hard, especially, man, there are moments as a parent where I, I, I want to embrace the saying and it's difficult to do, but the saying we use is try your best and forget the rest. Like we're on the same page that we're all just trying our best. But I think the fact that you're able to tell the truth, right. And just be real about it has to be so liberating for so many men that you work with. To just say like, yeah, this isn't perfect and it's not going to be perfect. Um, I mean, that's just huge. I feel like it gives people permission to actually do something rather than sit where they are and continue to do nothing and let it feel bad. Does that, is that your experience with the men that you work with? Yeah, I joke about it, but every, every man answers every question with three different answers, but they're all virtually the same. Good, fine, busy. Hey man, how are you? I'm good. How's the family? Oh, they're fine. How's work? Oh, I'm busy. Really, really busy. Good. Really busy. So, you know, one thing I've noticed is if you get in conversations like that, those everyday mundane conversations where you don't even have to think about what your answer is going to be, it's going to be good, fine, or busy. But if you just really relate to people and not that you have to be a negative Nelly, but like, you know, just in, even some of the humor in it, like, Hey man, how are the kids? Oh, they're good. I had to tell my 12 year old not to eat his cheese and crackers while he was taking a dump the other day. But other than that, we're great. Like, and I had to remind my seven year old to put on pants at the dinner table. Sure. Right. So, um, you know, that, that, that's just the world we live in. And that, you know, people are just like, oh my, and then they'll open up to you as, you know, reciprocity. Oh my gosh, man, I can totally relate. Like this just happened the other day, you know, and then all of a sudden we're out of that conversation of good, fine and busy and we're, we're deeper, right? Yeah, something real. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. What would you say are some of the more profound or important lessons you have learned along the way that, you know, those one little thing here and there that you get to pick up that have been really impactful for you or the men that you work with? Oh, that's a great question. Um, there's been so many just amazing lessons. Uh, but one, one thing I can tell you is let's talk about marriage for, are you married? Yeah. Okay. Three how, kiddos. Yeah. And how, how, three kids. Yeah. How old, how old are they? Eight, 10 and 14. 8, 10, and 14. Okay. And how long have you guys been married? 15 years. Okay. So it's like right around the same time we've been married. So we've been married 18 years this year. Okay. One thing that I used to think before doing this work was marriage was a feeling. Love was a feeling. Communication should come natural, right? Um, and we should just expect that the other person knows what it is that we need and what their role is. And that's just how marriage works. When you walk down the aisle, I mean, think of it like this, and and I'll get to my point, but my overall point is marriage is a skill. Communication is a skill. Partnership is a skill. All these things are skills. We don't, we don't view them that way. But if you think, if you think about how we're set up in today's society, as it pertains to marriage, we don't operate in any other part of our life. Like we do marriage. Like, so for instance, you got your degree in to to be a diet, a registered dietitian, right. With a minor in exercise science client comes to you and they want a food plan, right? Or they want, they want help. They want to be healthy. Now, if you didn't have a four-year undergrad degree and you just woke up one day and you're like, I think I'm going to be a dietitian today. And yep. That's what I'm going to be. Yep. And I'm, I'll figure it out. And someone comes to you and they're like, Hey, how, what, what kind of macro should I eat? And like, what is a vitamin C deficiency and how much more, what do I do to get more vitamin D? And you're like, no, I don't really know. I'll figure it out though. Don't, don't <laughs> best time your whole life. Don't even worry about it. I'll figure it out. And that we don't expect that. It takes 990 hours of training for you to be a cop from the beginning of police academy until you graduate 990 hours. Yet when we walk down the aisle and say, I do, most people don't even put in one hour of prep time. And what I can tell you in marriage, there's four elements to a legendary marriage, self-care, 
partnership, friendship, lovers. All of them have elements in there, and I won't, I won't get into it for the sake of time. All four of those pillars stand strongly on the, one of the most solid foundations in marriage, and that's communication. And within communication, you have active listening, tactical empathy, emotional validation, mirrors, labels, support, creating space, psychological safety, all these things, and they are skills. If you don't know how to do those things and you're just left to figure it out, that's when people are like, oh, I don't know, maybe we're not meant for each other. It's not yeah. feeling it, right? But when you learn that, so to, to hit that point home is parenting, being a human being, marriage, these are skills. And for some crazy reason, we don't look at it that way. We look at it as, oh, it should just come naturally and I'll just figure it out. But we don't do that. You've had three kids. I guarantee you wouldn't go to the hospital and have somebody other than an OBGYN who's got four years, a four-year degree and then four years of medical school deliver your baby. You're not going to ask the guy with the mop in the corner and be like, oh, there's been thousands of them. Don't worry, we'll figure it out. Just lay back. We'll be good. But we do that in our relationships. Like, what? what? Yeah. What's going on? Absolutely. That is so true. And uh, what a profound lesson to just carry into every single day. Like I have more to learn. I have more, I can understand. I can develop this area. I mean, that's really, really profound. What do you find like for the men that come to you in the um, dad edge Alliance, what are some of like the most common struggles that they're up against. Oh, totally. Um, so we have men apply to be a part of the mastermind. And when, when they apply, they fill out seven questions and we basically understand and what they've identified is what has their attention. It's like, why are they, why are they applying? Why are they there? Seven out of 10 men who apply want to create a marriage, a legendary marriage. These statistics will scare you. What I'm about ready to share with you. Yeah, Everybody kind of knows Steven here. <laughs> Everybody knows that the divorce rate's 50%. What people don't know is that the 50% that stay together, they're divided up equally into three camps, 33%, 33%, 33%. 33% of marriages that stay together can actually identify their relationship as working, that it's everything that they pretty much ever wanted. Like, hey, it's great. The second camp, the next one third, they're like, oh, it's all right. I don't want to break up. That's a lot of trouble okay it's kind of boring like just sort of like manage whatever it's cool then there's the the final camp which they have no connection there's probably a ton of emotional resentment they're spinning in totally different orbits they probably aren't even sleeping in the same bedroom they're they're roommates they're waiting for the kids to move out or their finances to be in order before they cut ties yeah so if you really think about it I think it's probably generous to say that it probably only 10 to 15% of people who walk down the aisle can actually say that their relationship's working. So that's a big one is like, Hey, how do I, and here's what I can say about the men that we've worked with. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, some men, right. The way we operate have bad reputations. Like, Oh, he doesn't understand me. He doesn't get me. He does this. He does that. But what I can tell you, if you get to the heart of the majority of men, they really, really want to fix the problems under their own roof. They just don't know how to do it. So marriage is a big one. The other one is patience. Patience is a big one. Not just patience with their kids or their business or where they're working, but patience with themselves. Like the great, like a like a man will t- will say this kind of stuff internally. If he blows up at his kids, he's angry at whatever his kids are doing. But then he's angry at himself for losing his cool. And here's the here's the to add salt into the wound, not only is he angry at himself, but he's angry that he's angry that, at himself. So he's frustrated that he's frustrated. I shouldn't even be frustrated at myself. Why am I so frustrated? I'm so frustrated that I did this thing, but yet I'm frustrated with me too. So patience is another big one. Uh, the other thing too, isolation is the enemy of excellence. And unfortunately, most men will live this quiet life of isolation and desperation. And that's not from a physical standpoint. That's from a mental and emotional standpoint. Men like to keep almost all relationships out here. I don't want you to see that I'm, I'm having a bad day. That's why I like to tell you I'm fine. That's why I like to tell you I'm good. Okay. Stay there. You know, but what I can tell you is men desperately want good hearted, 
uh, like-minded men around them to support them, to help them, to give them the stereotypical thing of most men is they don't like to stop and ask for directions. I don't know where that came from. Maybe that was a generation by, beyond us, but the men that I work with, they're like, no man, just tell me what aisle to go down in Lowe's and I'll find the drills. Like, I don't want to walk around the, the, the aisles. Like, just tell me what to do and how to do it. I will go do it. Yeah. And one thing that I can tell you, just a comparison, how men are living. Think about being in a dark room. Maybe it's a hundred feet by a hundred feet, dark room. You can't see a thing in front of your face. And in that room, you have elements in your mind and your heart on your marriage and your kids and your work and your fitness and your emotional health, your mental health, all these things. And you just feel like, would someone just turn on the light, please? And let me know what the next step is here and what it's like to be in a mastermind or in a community. It's a lot like this. It's a lot like a man coming up behind you. And this sounds weird, but I don't mean it sound weird. Putting his hand on your arm and say, hey, ma'am, 10 paces to the, to the front make a right five paces, make a left seven paces, go diagonal to the right, seven paces, reach your arm up three feet, light switch is right there. And men are like, oh, that's the way? Awesome, I'm gonna go do that. And it's the most, it takes up so much mental and emotional bandwidth, not knowing what to do next. And you feel like you're in that dark room alone and you're stepping on a tack, you're hitting the wall, you're stubbing your leg up against the desk and you're just like, oh, like just, but I'm good. I'm fine. I'm good. I'm fine. <laughs> kind of busy, but otherwise good and fine. <laughs> I'm busy in this dark room. Yeah, that's so interesting. I had, I don't even know what the actual stat on this is, but I had heard at one point um, that most men, the best friends they have in their lives are from high school or before. And that came to mind as you were mentioning, like being in that dark room where you feel really alone because all of the relationships, even maybe your kids and your partner are like at this arm's arm's length. And yeah, just like, it, it doesn't have to be a, you know, go rogue and find your own way. Like there are, you know, bands of brothers to join arms with and and make that headway together and with some knowingness and not just like shooting, you know, shooting darts, who knows where in this dark room. Uh, I mean, that just the power in that sounds life-changing to me. I'm guessing you've seen some pretty remarkable turnarounds in the people you work with. Yeah, we, we've, I mean, man, it, we, we and I, I'm not calling you man, um, but we've had okay. a lot of, <laughs> we've had a lot of amazing successes a lot of them have to do with men just knowing what to do next. So like, I'll, I'll give you a great example. Uh, one of the guys in our mastermind, uh, we, we, we run 32 groups a week. We have one guy in particular. I love this guy. He's an orthopedic surgeon and he never doesn't have a financial worry in the world. And he wanted to create this amazing relationship with his wife on a scale of one to 10. He said it was a five. He's like, I just want, he's like, I want legendary, man. I don't want normal. I'm tired of normal. Like I want amazing, right? So every week we, you know, dissected what he should do and how he should do it. And I'll give you an example. So he's like, well, what do I do? I was like, here's what you do. I was like, you know, you call her from your office on Monday and this is what you tell her. And don't worry about the how we'll help you with the how, but this is what you tell her. I've got a babysitter set up for this Friday. Be ready by six. I'm picking you up. He's, what do I do then? Don't worry, man. We'll, we'll, we got you. Okay. Just do it. And he did it. Now what? I'm like, okay, you're going to take her out on a date. When was the last time you're on a date? Oh man, it's been months. I think we went on two dates in the last 12 months. Like, what, what, so what do I do on the date? Like, do, we're just going to stare at each other and talk about the kids. I was like, that's not where you're going to talk. You have a 10 minute rule. You have a 10 minute container to have what we call the logistical conversation. Hey, how was your week? How was your day? How are the kids? Blah, blah, blah. Boom, you're done. Now we want you to do what's called create psychological safety and ask her future-based generative questions based on your vision as a couple. It's like, well, what does that even mean? I was like, well, here's what you do. Ask her this. Say, so, you know what? If you and I were sitting on our porch 20 years from now and we were holding up our favorite glass of wine and we toasted and we were sharing and celebrating the amazing life that we had created together and all these amazing memories, 
what are we celebrating that hasn't happened yet? And he's like, <laughs> he gets out of bed. Oh my God, it's awesome. Right. So, and we're like, okay. And we gave him like two more questions. We're like, okay, that's your homework next week. Come back. Tell us how, how it went. So here's the thing, you know, the, the quality of your life and the quality of your relationships depends on the quality of the questions that you're asking yourself and those around you. So if you're asking, how was your day? What's for dinner? What are we doing this weekend? That's what's going to come up. But if you're asking a quality question like that and you listen, the other thing too about men and just human beings in general, if you listen with curiosity and appreciation instead of expectation and agenda, some amazing things will emerge out of that conversation because most people enter into every interaction with expectation and agenda. So Cole, I'm going to come talk to you because I want to talk to you about this and I want this outcome. Instead, if I came to you and I said, I want to have a conversation about you because I want to know how you really feel about this and tell me what's on your mind. And then what I would do back is instead of problem solve or be your fixer, I would want to emotionally validate or let you know that I'm listening to you by validating and mirroring, right? And when you're doing those things, when you're using those skills, it actually makes you a better listener, right? So like, those are just some of the things that we do. We just help men refine some skills so that they can have those deeper connections with the people that matter most to them. Yeah. Wow. It's amazing. And I'm guessing just being in community also knowing that this group of men have your back and, you know, are, are there to support you. And if that date goes sideways, like there's a, you know, a group ready to catch you and help you make a new plan for the next Friday or whatever it is. Um, that's just remarkable. Now, can I share something about what you just said right there? I love that because not all conversation is going to go sunshine and rainbows, right? When you listen with curiosity and appreciation, something might come up that you're not, gonna, you're not prepared for, right? And that's where having a board of directors, having community really helps because that's when you can be like, well, man, I did this and here's what happened. Okay, look, great. That's great information to know. Now here's what we do. So we thought we were going to do this, but instead we're doing this. So it's, it's a, you're able to pivot quicker. You know, it's kind of like, um, best way I can describe it is it's the, the person who works out all the time and they don't get any results, right? And then they meet with that trainer and they change things up and they're like, okay, that's not working. Now we're going to do this. Oh, that didn't work. We're going to, now we're going to do this, right? And they're constantly shaping and, and, and pivoting at what they're going to be doing with that client, right? Pointing them in the right direction. So they continue to get good results because what works today might not work tomorrow and you got to be ready to pivot. Right. Yeah, absolutely. What are you finding and seeing? I, my mind's been on this because of the mention about the isolation, which, you know, we've all kind of been in some form of isolation during this pandemic time. What are some of the like extraordinary challenges that are coming to the table now that we can't necessarily be in community or in our same job or whatever it might be, the things that are, you know, part and parcel of the time we're in right now? That's a great question. And, you know, the COVID and the pandemic and that's all. So I, I think what we've been seeing over the past year, we've got the pandemic. People are very uncertain about what they can and can't do. And they're paranoid to pick up, you know, a virus, which makes them even more fearful. Like I was, I was telling my wife the other day, I was like, I miss seeing people's faces because I feel like when I'm in the grocery store, I can't truly see that other person. You can see if a person's having a good moment, bad moment, if they're distracted, if they're overwhelmed, can't read people just looking at their eyes without the rest, right? So that adds this layer of like keeping everyone even more out here. Like not only do I not want to be around you because I need to be six feet away from you, but I can't even tell what you're feeling based on what I can see, right? So there's this huge disconnect. So you got that going on. Then you've got everything that we experienced in 2020. We won't even get into that. But then like this political uncertainty, right? And a lot of things have, have happened even over the past four or five months that have never happened in human history, which adds, so people right now are, are very isolated, very uncertain, and very charged, right? Yeah. So it's how do, we, how do we do that? So I'll, I'll give you an example of something that we did. 
as a family. We've got four boys, 15, 13, seven, and five. And when this whole thing hit, I'll never forget, I brought my oldest to an OAR concert. We flew from St. Louis to North Carolina and we got, got to meet the band. I actually had Mark Roberts on the show, on the podcast, the lead singer. And it was this amazing trip. And I remember hearing rumblings. I'll never forget when we met the band, their um, saxophone player refused to shake our hands. He's like, nope, don't, don't touch me. And that was the very first interaction I ever had with any human being of don't touch me. And I was like, wow, like how? It was weird because I was like, how serious is this really going to get? Like, probably, probably a joke, right? And then lo and behold, two weeks later, boom, everything shuts down. So for two months, my wife and I and our boys, like we were depressed. Kids were, you know, school shut down. Everything was virtual. Uh, kids were depressed. Like we were really concerned about our kids' mental health and our own. So we went back to that thing where the quality of your life depends on the quality of the questions that you're asking yourself. So my wife and I sat down and I'll never forget this. We were sitting on our deck and we were having coffee and I was like, we got to do something different. We got to do something different. Like, what do you think? She's like, I don't know. I was like, well, you know, all these guests on the podcast are always talking about questions, better questions. And we're, we're asking ourselves what Mark Devine will call the why can't I question feeding the fear wolf, right? Why can't things be the way they are? Why can't we do this? Why can't we do this? And Mark is a big proponent, as you know, that whatever you ask, your brain is like Google and it will give you the answer. So I was like, well, what if we ask this, Jess? I was like, what if we, how might we connect in a way as a family we never have because we're facing things we've never faced? And how at the end of 2020, what would we be celebrating that we did despite COVID? And we came up with a plan. And that plan was, I was going to take every Wednesday off. And for 12 straight weeks, the rule was we were going to go on a family adventure. And the rule was do something you've never done, done and go somewhere you've never been. And we ended off 2020, probably the closest as a family unit we've ever been. And we ended it actually in Disney of all places. We were just like, you know, we went on these amazing adventures every week. They were still safe. Let's go out with a bank. And I made a post on our inst on my Instagram and it just, just basically said, thank you, COVID. Thank you, COVID, for the connections. And there were all these pictures that I put of all of us in different places and different things that we had never done. And I think if you ask yourself that question, how might we connect in a way that we never have because we're facing things we've never faced and just see what emerges, what answers come up? Yeah, I love that because it could be completely different for any family, any man, any partnership. I mean, that answer, but that the question's good enough to elicit something that is meaningful to you. I mean, it kind of gives me like a little excitement just thinking about even sitting down with my own family and asking that. And, you know, we had a very uh, similar experience in that we just decided that this is an obstacle, but how do we turn that obstacle into our opportunity? Because there's been a lot of things in life where it feels like you're suffering, right? Like there's something in your way. And then, man, you look back down the road and you're like, that was, like, I needed that. That thing was good for me. Um, so I love flipping it on its head faster to see the good more quickly. Yeah. What do you think has been, so you're the dad of four boys, the work that you're doing, how does that influence what you see for them in the future? That's a good question. Um, you know, I, I, for them, I like to ask my kids really deep questions and just get to their heart and their mind. And I try not to over complicate fatherhood. You know, I, I, you know, I, I, I interviewed a podcast guest yesterday and he said something that, that just <laughs> made so much sense. And it was so simple. Your child is the expert of who they are and all you have to do is guide them. And I was like, wow, that's really, really powerful because what we do as parents is we try to mold them. Let me put you into, let me make you into the thing I think you should be. And I'll guide you to that. Versus like, what brings you as a little human being joy and fulfillment? And then how can I guide you along the way, right? So we're not hitting too many walls or we can brush ourselves off when mistakes are made. 
But what I can tell you is, you know, I, I ask my kids really deep questions to get them thinking about things in different ways, especially when they're challenged. Right. And what I've noticed is, is now with the older ones is that they do the same. Like my 15 year old is notorious because he won't ask me, how was your day? He'll be like, what was the best part of your day, dad? Like, <laughs> He's on to the game. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, come on now. And you know, other things too, like, you know, I, my 13 year old, um, you know, it, it, it actually, I, I'm not a big crier in front of my kids. Um, but I was brought to tears with my 13 year old because, um, he plays football, he loves football and he is, he's a defensive end and he's on the line. Also, he's not a big kid. He's small, but he's super strong and he's a long snapper. So he snaps the ball for the field goal and he's the only kid on the team that can long snap. I don't know how he even learned. I don't I, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie Coming to America, but like that's how I grew up playing. You know, football is like, oh, pigskin through a big H. Like yes. that's, I know nothing about it. So, but the center got sick for the championship, for the semifinal game and the championship game. The center, this kid's been the center for four years. So, who could, who's the only other kid that could snap? It was Mason. And they told Mason, like, you need to be center. And I was just like, oh my God, like he's a hundred and He's 120 pounds. The center is a 190, 200 pound kid. And Mason was just like, yep, I'll do it. And I was like, wow. So he just stepped right into it. He was so uncertain. And in that two, in that two weeks, we snapped 800 snaps just over and over 50, 60, 70, 80 of them a day. And it was all his idea. He's like, I, I, I got to learn this. Like I got to be on point. And when I asked him about this, and this is what brought me to tears, I'm like, dude, I was like, you could have gone any direction. Like when your coach asked you to step up, you could have been like, no, man, I'm not comfortable. Like the, the kid across from me weighs 220 pounds. Like how am I even, gonna, how am I supposed to snap this ball and defend myself, right? And then you could have been like, I'm too nervous. I'm too scared. I'm too this, I'm too that. I was like, what, what got you through that? And he's like, I don't know. He's like, I just, wanted to see if I could do it. And I wanted to do something for my team. And I didn't hesitate when they, what what was I going to say? No. And I was like, were you scared? He's like, I was terrified. He's like, but I knew that I'd be better when it was all said and done. And I was like, how old are you? So it's like just that insight, you know, to where, so to answer your question, it's like, if we could evolve our kids, right to be okay with failure and fear and risk. Cause one of the biggest conversations that we did have through that whole two weeks, cause it was every night. I'm really scared, dad. I'm scared. I'm going to snap wrong. I'm scared. I'm going to get hit really hard, you know? And he really hung his hat on. I'm scared. So I'm weak. And one thing I told him, and I learned this from podcast guests is dude, like, look at, look at a guy like Mark divine. Cause Mason actually was there with me when I was on Mark's show. And so Mark got to meet him. I was like, what what does Mark always say? Mark says, courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is acting in spite of fear. So like, look at somebody like Mark, who terrified probably on every mission he went on, but what did he do? He, He leaned into his courage and he executed despite that fear. So it's okay, totally okay for you to be afraid. In fact, I would be more worried about you if you're like, no, I'm good, man. I'm fine. I'm going to be busy. I'm not scared. Right. But no, he wasn't, he was very, you know, he, he admitted where he was at and he still executed. So, you know, I think that those are good life lessons for kids. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. The, the willingness to fail and to still show up, that's really powerful. And you said something else that really resonated with me, which was that you hold the space for them to evolve. And I really, that's something that as a mom, and I know Jake would agree as a dad is that we do, we inherently like cultivate the life that is familiar to us. Right. But like my daughter is this artsy fartsy, like I know nothing about the things that she's into, but I just, every day I'm like, just hold the space for her like, give her the room to do that because she, I don't want her to be me. Like I'm me. She's her and she's fabulous the way she is, you know? 
So that, yeah, holding the space for them to become who they are is really an amazing lesson. Totally. Yeah. Oh, man. We, I think, could go on and on, but I think we'll wrap it up before we go too long here. How can people find you and the Dad Edge Alliance? Yeah, I think you, I mean, you can find everything we're doing at gooddadproject.com. Uh, yeah, you can find the podcast. You can find the alliance there. Alliance is gooddadproject.com forward slash alliance. Uh, you got to apply to if you want in on that. Um, after you apply, one of one of our team members will reach out to you, set up a quick Zoom call to get to know you. Everything we do is personal. We don't we're not a we're not a machine. Um, we everything we do is personal, and we want to make sure men get results. So that's what happens after that. Podcast is downloaded everywhere. I just got word two weeks ago that we're now on Pandora Radio, which is awesome. Uh, so I think you can literally download the podcast wherever podcasts are downloaded. But that's where you can find everything that we're doing. Awesome. Well, I definitely encourage everyone listening to check it out. Um, the patience workshop, marriage work. I mean, there were a, a lot of resources that really hit home. So uh, definitely check it out. But thank you so much for joining us today. I really, really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you for having me.